All right, our next speaker is uh, J.J. Gao. There's been a, a lot of talk today about uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors and their promise for the treatment of kidney cancer. So J.J. is going to give us a sort of a summary of where we stand with regards to immunotherapy for uh, metastatic kidney cancer. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to give you a brief review of the history of immunotherapy, um, but more importantly, I would like to share with you some new data um, on the immune checkpoint therapy, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty exciting, as Dr. Tonier just talked about. So why are we interested in immunotherapy? So the short answer is uh, immunotherapy can kill tumor cells. However, immunotherapy kills tumor cells in a very different way comparing to the trend comparing to the traditional chemotherapy and the new target agents uh, Dr. Tanira just talked about. Uh, first, um, immunotherapy is, is ad adaptable. So when it activates the immune system, if tumor cells change, and uh, the immune system can also change. Second, it's specific. So it targets specifically tumor cells and uh, spare the healthy host cells from toxicity. Third, uh, it has memory. Uh, it actually has great memory. So when uh, tumor cells hibernate, hi hibernate you know, for like five, 10 years, after they wake up, the immune system can still recognize them and, uh, and kill them. So uh, theoretically, they can offer long-term survival. Through history, uh, scientists and the clinicians uh, have tried to develop different types of immunotherapies. This include cytokine, uh, vaccine, adopt T cell transfer, adopted T cell transfer, and uh, immune checkpoint therapy. So I'm going to only focus on cytokine therapy and the immune checkpoint blockade therapy today, as the data on these two types of therapies are more uh, mature. So as Dr. Tanier just mentioned, the first breakthrough for, uh, treat for the treatment of renal cell carcinoma uh, was high-dose IL-2, uh, which was de developed in the 1980s. So eventually, uh, in 1982, high-dose IL-2 was approved by the FDA for the treatment of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So um, high-dose IL-2 basically kills tumor cells by stimulating the CD8 T cells, which is known as cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and natural killer cells. In addition to high-dose IL-2, interferon alpha and interferon beta were also shown to have activities uh, against renal cell carcinoma. So they do this by, one, stimulating the immune system, two, by directly inhibiting tumor cell growth. So here is the data on high-dose IL-2. As you can tell from this graph, for those patients who have complete response, uh, they actually can live for a long time, up to 10 years or beyond. However, for those patients who only have partial response, the median overall survival is only about two years. And uh, these are the pros and cons of high-dose IL-2 therapy. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, so the long-term survival of 10 years or beyond is very appealing. However, the response rate is very low. Only less than 7% of patients will have complete response, and only about 15% of patients will have partial response, and then the rest of patients will not have response uh, from high-dose IL-2 therapy. It is also very toxic, so patients often require ICU care uh, due to heart failure or septic shock-like symptoms. Therefore, this type of therapy is limited only to what's called the healthier patients, which means for patients who are older, who do not have great organ functions, such as you know, with COPD, uh, diabetes, um, heart, my, even mild heart failure or renal failure. So these patients will not benefit from such treatment. And uh, here's the data. Um, showing um, the in, um, interferon with and without bevacizumab, which is a standard of care uh, target therapy for renal cell carcinoma, as Dr. Tanir just mentioned. 
So uh, interferon alone overall can cause a response in about 13% of patients. And then when bevacizumab was added, uh, so about 25% of patients will respond to such therapy. And the median free survival for interferon alone is about five months. When bevacizumab was added, uh, the uh, progression-free survival was increased to uh, over eight months. However, addition of bevacizumab to interferon gamma did not cause any significant prolongation of overall survival. And uh, so I'm going to spend the most of, of, of the time uh, talking about immune checkpoint therapy. This is truly a, a very exciting development uh, in treating kid, not only kidney cancer, uh, but also uh, many other different types of malignancies. Uh, this was de developed by uh, James Allison, who is the director of the immunotherapy platform at MD Anderson. So uh, what is immune checkpoint blockade therapy? So I'm going to give you uh, a very brief introduction of the background of immunology. So this is a, a, a pretty difficult task. <laughs> But uh, if you just follow me step by step, I think you will understand this very well. Uh, so in order for the T cells to be activated to kill tumor cells, there have to be two sets of signals. We call it signal one and signal two. So signal one is provided by a molecule. It's called T cell receptor on the T cells, or TCR. Um, and the tumor antigens presented on the antigen-presenting cells. That's the first set of signal. The second set of signal is produced by the, is provided by the interaction between two molecules. One is called CD28, and the other one is called B7. So with these two sets of signals, you can achieve a pretty good tumor, tumor cell killing. However, tumor cells are very smart. They actually can express uh, some molecules to inhibit the T cells. And uh, the T cell by, by, by itself can also inhibit, can also express some um, inhibitory molecules to curb the immune response. Why? Because if you keep activating your immune system without a break, so it will actually cause damage to your body. So there is some checks and balance molecules here. One of them is known as CTLA-4, one of the breaks. The other break is known as PD-1. Uh, the third one is known as PDL-1, and the fourth one is PDL-2. So once these uh, inhibitory molecules are uh, engaged uh, with T cells, so the tumor cell killing is actually uh, uh, is, is damaged. So what Dr. Allison found was uh, when he used these mono monoclonal antibodies, to take away these breaks. So he can keep these T cells uh, you know, consistently activated for tumor cell killing. As a result, um, you have more tumor cell killing. So that's the basics of immune checkpoint therapy. So the first immune checkpoint agent was called ipilimumab, or anti-CTY4, which is against uh, this molecule here. So it was tested in uh, metastatic melanoma as you know, uh, as you probably know, metastatic melanoma is probably even worse than kidney cancer, metastatic kidney cancer. So on average, these patients can live only about uh, 12 months. So if you look at this phase three data, the data alone uh, appear not to be very impressive because most of these patients actually don't uh, benefit from such therapy. However, about 20% of patients will survive uh, for up to almost five years. So considering most patients only live for about 12 months, this is pretty striking. And then when you add another agent, it's, uh, it's called nivolumab, which is anti-PD-1, uh, sorry, which, which is this molecule here. So the result is even more striking. As I mentioned, these uh, metastatic melanoma patients only uh, live on average of 12 months. Uh, but at 12 months here, when you use the two agents, so over 80% of these patients st were still alive. So even at almost three years, more than 70% of these patients 
uh, was still alive. So this is a truly amazing result. And because of this, um, immunotherapy was regarded as breakthrough of the year in 2013 by the Science Magazine. So what about this checkpoint therapies on renal cell carcinoma? So this was the first phase two clinical trial of ipilimumab or anti-CTOF4 for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. At lower dose, ipilimumab actually didn't have very much activity um, for renal cell carcinoma. However, at a uh, higher dose, which is the standard dose as used um, for melanoma patients, so the response was quite modest. Um, it, only five of 40 patients actually had response, which is about uh, 13%. What about nivolumab, which is the anti-PD-1? That's the second immune checkpoint blockade agent. So uh, this was recently published uh, in journal uh, of clinical oncology uh, by Bob Malta. So as you, they tested nivolumab at different, three different concentrations, uh, 0 0.3 milligram per kg, 2 milligram per kg, and a 10 milligram per kg. And here is the progression-free survival, which is not very impressive. It's only uh, 2.7, 4.0, and 4.2. The response rate is, you know, for all three concentrations, uh, was about 20%. However, the median overall survival is pretty significant. As you can remember, if you remember uh, the interferon gamma plus bevacizumab, the the uh, median overall uh, overall survival median overall survival was about 18 months. Here, it's increased to about 25 months at higher concentration of nivolumab. So there is a phase three trial. Um, Comparing anti-PD-1 or nivolumab against Everlimus, uh, this trial has, has finished recruitment, and uh, hopefully we can, we can hear about the data uh, later this year. And uh, I hope this agent can be approved um, by, uh, by the FDA for, for the treatment of uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So what about uh, the combination therapy of anti-PD-1 or nivolumab? Um, and ipilimumab, since you know they were so so uh, impressive in metastatic metastatic melanoma. So here uh, is a phase one trial, uh, basically testing a combination of different concentrations of uh, different doses of nivolumab plus ipilimumab, uh, either at um, three milligram of nivolumab plus one milligram of uh, of uh, nivolumab or um, three milligram of uh, ipilimumab plus one milligram per kg of nivolumab. So here is the data. So as you can tell, uh, for both these groups, the the response rates uh, were very impressive. For for nivolumab at three milligram per kg plus ipilimumab at one milligram per kg, the overall response rate was forty three percent, and the stable disease rate. Uh, is 24%. Um, so when you reverse this concentration, the overall response rate was still 43%, but the stable disease rate was 35%. Um, However, uh, this arm was shown to be uh, very toxic. So uh, currently, uh, the standard combination regimen is actually nivolumab of 3 mg per kg plus ipilimumab of 1 mg per kg. So overall, as you can tell, uh, about 60 to 70 percent of patients actually can benefit such from such combination therapy, and uh, if you remember the high dose IL-2 uh, response rate, it was about you know 15 to 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 20 percent. This is uh, this is much more impressive. And uh, again, this is the progression-free survival, which is uh, about uh, uh, six months. So. Um, there is currently there is a phase three randomized uh, trial comparing this combination therapy with nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus sutent um, in patients who were previous, previously untreated um, metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma. So this trial is currently open and led by Dr. Tanir. Uh, so uh, we uh, just enrolled some patients uh, during the past couple of weeks. So here is the uh, study design. So 
basically these patients, uh, this population of patients will be untreated. Uh, they will also need tissue for uh, biomarker staining, uh, which is similar to what um, this lady just, uh, just asked about. So this is how we use this biomarker to guide therapy in the future. So these patients will be randomized into two arms. Uh, in arm A, patients will be treated with nivolumab plus uh, ipilimumab. In arm B, they will receive standard therapy agent, uh, Sutin, which is one of the best um, uh, target agents for treating metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So, um, so that's the combination between the immune checkpoint agents. What about the combination of immune checkpoint blockade agents plus the, the, the target agents. So there is one trial, uh, a phase one trial, to uh, evaluate the combination of an nivolumab plus either sutin or pazopinib. So this trial, this is the trial design, so uh, it's a little bit uh, confusing here. So basically, it's two arms. One arm using sutin, uh, plus different concentrations of nivolumab. The other one is pazopinib plus increasing concentrations of nivolumab as well. So here is the result. As you can tell, for the patients who get uh, sutin plus nivolumab, the overall response rate uh, was 52%. Stable disease was 30%. So when patients get pazopinib plus nivolumab, the over overall response rate uh, was uh, 45 Percent and the stable disease uh, was 35 percent. So in total, about 80 percent of patients actually uh, benefit from such combination. So this is even more striking, uh, more impressive comparing to the to the two checkpoint blockade agents of uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab. And uh, the progression so free survival here is also increased when. So in the sutin plus nivolumab group, the progression-free survival is about one year. And, uh, and uh, uh, for the pazopinib plus nivolumab group, uh, the progression-free survival was eight months. So uh, as, you as you can recall, um, for the previous trials, most of the progression-free survival was anywhere between four to eight months. So this one actually increased to uh, uh, to 12 months. Uh, we have another combination trials um, currently open at MD Anderson. So by testing uh, uh, combinations of nivolumab plus either ipilimumab or bevacizumab, which, uh, which is a standard of care um, target agent for renal cell carcinoma. So this is a pre-surgical trial in patients who have metastatic renal cell carcinoma, but eligible for cytoreductive uh, nephrectomy, which is to take out the primary tumor, as Dr. Wood talked about earlier today. So uh, in this trial, patients uh, will be randomized into onto three different arms. So in the first arm, the uh, patients will be treated with nivolumab only uh, every two weeks for three doses. After that, they will have surgery to take out their primary kidney cancer. So if they derive clinical benefit before surgery, which means if they have clinical response of stable disease, after surgery, they will still be given nivolumab as maintenance therapy. Uh, the second arm is, on the second arm, patients will be treated with nivolumab plus bevacizumab. And uh, just this is also every two weeks for three doses followed by surgery, followed by maintenance therapy. The, on the third arm, um, people will be, patients will be treated with nivolumab plus ipilimumab, but this is every three weeks because you know, these two combinations is more toxic. So uh, for, for two doses, followed by surgery plus, um, followed by surgery uh, plus maintenance therapy if they benefited pre-surgical, um, prior to surgery. So um, the advantage of this trial is it will allow us to collect pre and post treatment blood and also tumor tissues. And in this way, we can study the biology um, even in a, in a very organized way to inform us what patients will 
benefit from this therapy? What patients will not benefit from this therapy if they don't in the future? You know, um, whether how can we basically put them on different uh, a different type of treatment? So uh, one thing I want to bring to your attention uh, that's immune related toxicity, which is. Uh, which is also known as IRAEs, which stands for Immune-Related Adverse Events. So you will probably hear about more and more. So despite the very exciting um, data on immune checkpoint therapy, they are also associated with very significant toxicities. And these toxicities will require a very, very good communication, very timely communication between our patients and the clinical team to manage these toxicities. So here I listed the five most common, but also potentially fatal toxicities. The first one is called pneumonitis, which means inflammation of the lungs. So uh, when patients experience shortness of breath, even very mildly even on exertion, especially with exertion, we should know about this right away. There's just a few days of delay can cause death. So this is, this is uh, known nationally. The second one is diarrhea uh, or colitis, which means inflammation of the, of the colon. So if you have just one or two episodes of diarrhea on this type of, uh, of drugs, uh, or abdominal pain, cramping, you need to cause immediately. So if you, um, you know, if you delay for a few days, so this can be very difficult to treat. And, uh, and then this can also result in death. The third one is called hepatitis, or inflammation to the liver. So this one is difficult to find for, for the patient because often you just have some vague symptoms like fatigue, some pain in the, in the, in the, uh, in the right abdomen. So, but often you don't feel very much unless uh, you, know, you did lab tests and uh, uh, and a reveal elevation of liver enzymes. So um, this one can also be fatal if, if it, it's treated too late. The first one was called hypophysitis, which means the inflammation of the pituitary gland. This one is also very dangerous. Um, so if you experience headache, acute vision change, fatigue, or if you measure blood pressure at home, you find your blood pressure is in the 70s or 80s. So that, that suggests you might have this, uh, this uh, hypophysitis. So the, the danger of hypophysitis, it, it drops your, uh, your hormone, including cortisol, including um, the thyroid ho hormone. So when cortisol is dropped, so your blood sugar can drop, and then your blood pressure can drop dramatically. This way, you can, you can pass out very easily. Um, so we should know about this as as soon as possible. So even you know this, even a day can make a, a huge difference here. The f uh, the fifth one is very common. Uh, most patients actually have certain type of dermatitis or rash on your body. So if it's if it's mild and it does not progress very much, it's actually very easy to treat. You can just put some Benadryl cream on it or hydrocortisone cream. However, if it gets worse to the point that you have blisters on your, on, your, um, on your skin, you have to come to the hospital. You have to call us immediately, come to the ER for evaluation. So uh, because this can progress very fast, and then uh, before long, you can have your skin uh, slough off your body. And at that time, it can be fatal as well. So the key here is, um, if you have any of these symptom, symptoms, you just tell us early. And then once, you, once we know, know about this, we will do a bunch of labs, doing some uh, very quick tests, and we will put you on high dose steroid. Most likely, you will be fine. But if it's delayed, it's very, very dangerous. So in summary, uh, high dose IL-2 therapy provides long-term survival, but with low response rate and a, a significant toxicity. Anti-CDLF4, anti-PD-1. Uh, there is another one, it's called anti pd one that I didn't talk, but they each have modest activity against uh, renal cell carcinoma. However, combination therapy, uh, including anti-CDLF4 plus anti-PD-1, or anti-PD-1 plus the target agents, provides a higher response rate 
with uh, pending survival data at this time. So immune-related toxicity have to be managed as early as possible. So I would like to thank you very much uh, for, for your attention, and also I would like to thank our patients for participation of these clinical trials. As you can see from this history, so this is, you know, all these amazing advances was essentially um, done on our patients, with our patients, and uh, actually by our patients along with our um, research team. Without your support, these advances uh, should not, could, could not have been possible. So thank you very much. Any, uh, any questions for JJ? Thank you. Thanks.